this video, we're going to talk about a different method for finding absolute maximum and absolute minimum called the Lagrange multiplier method. This is part one. Later in the week, I'm going to post the second video, part two. So when we have an optimization problem, we tend to use the following terminology. A function that we're trying to find the maximum or minimum of, that is the thing that we're trying to optimize, is called our objective function. Now, usually, there's one or more constraint equations, which they limit the types of input values which can be used to achieve the optimum value. And we've seen these types of problems in Calculus 1 and probably other classes as well. So here's our simple example. If you, of all the rectangles with perimeter 8, find the dimensions of the rectangle with the most area. Well, our objective function is the area. We're trying to find the most area. And for a rectangle, that's just length times width. So we'll just use x and y instead of length and width. And the constraint equation would be 2x plus 2y equals 8. Now, the other thing that we may say, instead of listing the constraint equation as a constraint equation, we use the phrase subject to. So our problem would be maximize a of x comma y equals xy subject to 2x plus 2y equals 8. Now, geometrically or graphically, what does this mean? Well, the area function is a function of two variables. Its graph is a surface, which is actually a hyperbolic paraboloid. And that is this multicolored surface that we see here. And 2x plus 2y equals 4 is an equation of a plane. This cyan or bluish color right here is the plane. So what we're trying to do with our optimization problem is we'd like to find the point on the surface. So remember, every point on the surface represents an area. But the only ones who have an area with coordinate, uh, well, with perimeter four. OK, I recognize I changed from my perimeter from being eight to four. But no matter, same idea. With perimeter four are the points that are on the plane. So this intersection here, which is a curve, the intersection between the plane and the surface, those are the only points that I could use. And I'd like to find the point that gives me the largest area, which in this case would be the largest z value, z value or z coordinate. So another way we could examine that geometrically is using level curves. So the level curves for the uh, hyperbolic paraboloid are indeed hyperbolas. So here's the one, the level curve for when z equals 1. Uh, and the uh, constraint equation then is actually a line in the xy plane, x plus y equals 2. And so wherever the level curve intersects the constraint equation, those are what we call feasible solutions. In other words, those are solutions where the perimeter satisfies the constraint equation. So there's two possible solutions. And that should make sense. We should be able to interchange the length and the width. We get two possible solutions whose perimeter is 4, and then the z value is telling me the area, whose area is 1. All right, well, I'd like to find the largest possible z value. So let's try a different level curve. Here's the level curve for z equals 2. So again, I get two points. And here I get 
z equals 3. Now notice one thing about these feasible solutions. They're getting closer and closer together. So as the level curves move out further and further. So the level curve with the largest z value is going to just touch the constraint equation curve at one point. And so it will actually be tangent. So we'll have the level curve tangent to the equation from the constraint or the graph of the constraint equation. And so it looks like that z equals 4 is going to be the largest possible area. So now if we have a curve that's two curves that are tangent, well certainly the gradient of this function is going to be number one orthogonal to the level curve, which means it's going to also be orthogonal to the constraint equation, and it's going to point in the direction of greatest ascent. So z value is moving up. And so the gradient vector at that point is going to be parallel to the gradient vector that would correspond to the constraint equation. And that's the key of the Lagrange multiplier method. So if I'm trying to optimize a function of two variables, and it's subject to a constraint which has two variables, and just by convention we, we set the constraint equal to zero. Any equation can be made to equal zero. And we are assuming here that we have a solution. So if we're looking for a maximum, there is a maximum. And if we're looking for a minimum, that there is actually a minimum. So at that solution, the gradient of f is going to be parallel to the gradient of g. And what does it mean for two vectors to be parallel? That means there's a non-zero number lambda such that the gradient of f is lambda times the gradient of g. Or in other words, if I write it out in components, that the gradient vector is lambda times the gradient vector of g. So the solution to the optimization problem can be reduced to an algebraic problem, an algebraic system of equations. I'll get one equation for every component in the gradient vector, plus I have the constraint equation. Now this number lambda is what we call the Lagrange multiplier. That's why it's called the Lagrange multiplier method. So let's go back to our uh, rectangle problem. So we're going to use the perimeter being four units. We're going to find the dimensions of the rectangle, which has the largest area. We're going to use the Lagrange multiplier method. Obviously, we could use this we don't even need calculus, honestly, to solve this problem. But we're going to use the garage multiplier method to demonstrate how to use it. So we're solving the optimization problem, f of x comma y equals xy, subject to the constraint that 2x plus 2y equals 4. And we're going to rewrite that as x plus y minus 2 equals 0. So then my g function is x plus y minus 2. So the gradient of f is just y comma x, and the components of the gradient of g are just 1 and 1. So now let's set up the system of equations using the fact that the gradient of f equals lambda times the gradient of g. So looking at the first component, I'll get y equals lambda times 1. Second component says x equals lambda times 1. And the constraint equation is x plus y minus 2 equals 0. So if I just set, uh, this just says that lambda equals y, lambda equals x. So that means that 
x must equal y. And this is kind of the typical flow of these problems, is you typically want to solve for lambda, and then you'll get some relation between x and y, and then you use that relation to substitute back into the constraint equation. So if I replace y with x, then I get x plus x minus 2 equals 0, which of course means that x equals 1 and y equals 1. In our next example, we're going to actually have a function of three variables, but the Lagrange multiplier method is still valid. We're just going to have three components in our gradient vector instead of two components, but the method is exactly the same. So what we're asked to find is the shortest distance from the point 2, comma, 0, comma, negative 3 to the plane x plus y plus z equals 4. This is another uh, problem that could be solved without using the Lagrange multiplier method, but we're just going to use it here to demonstrate it. So how would we find the distance from two points? Well, if I want to find it, if I say x, y, z is some point on the plane, then the distance formula would give me this equation. But working with a radical um, is possible, but it's just going to be much simpler to uh, use as our optimization or our objective function the square of the distance, which would just be quantity x minus 2 squared plus y squared plus quantity z plus 3 squared. This works because the squared function is always increasing. So maximizing or minimizing the square of d is going to give us the same x, y, and z as optimizing d itself. So we're going to solve the following equation, or so following optimization problem. We're going to minimize f of x, comma, y, comma, z equals quantity x minus 2 squared plus y squared plus quantity z plus 3 squared subject to x plus y plus z minus 4 equals 0. So we want to minimize the distance to a point on the plane. That's what this constraint equation does. It enforces the constraint that the point must be on the plane. And so our formula for g, now g is also a function of three variables, it's just going to be x plus y plus z minus 4 equals 0. All right, so what do I need? I need the gradient of f, and I'm not going to multiply that out. I'm just going to leave it as um, two parentheses x minus 2 in the first component, in the second component 2y, and in the third component, two parentheses, z plus three. Uh, the gradient of g is just one comma one comma one. And so we will use the fact that the gradient of f is a Lagrange multiplier lambda times the gradient of g to get the following system of equations. And remember, the flow again is usually we want to have lambda equal to each other. And uh, from that, we'll get a relationship between x, y, and z. And we'll make a substitution into the constraint equation. So the first two equations combined means that 2x minus 4 equals 2y, just setting those two equal to each other, or x equals y plus 2. The second and third equations imply that 2z plus 6 equals 2y, and I can solve that for z to get z equals y minus 3. So now I can replace this expression for x in the constraint equation, this expression for z in the constraint equation, and then I'll have an equation with only y in it. And let me so go ahead and solve that for y. I'll get y equals 5 thirds. And then using these equations for x and z, 
I can find that x is 11 thirds and z is negative 4 thirds. So my shortest distance, now I've got to go back and use the actual d formula, not the d squared. So I go ahead and substitute my x, y, and z that I found into the distance formula, and I get 5 radical 3 over 3. Now I can actually check my answer. There's actually a formula in the book which tells you uh, the uh, distance from a plane to a point not on the plane. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, if I go from my point P to Q, if this is the shortest distance, then it sh the PQ vector should be orthogonal to the plane. And if it's orthogonal to the plane, then it's got to be parallel to the plane's normal vector, which happens to be the same as gradient of g. So let's calculate pq. It winds up being uh, 5 thirds, comma 5 thirds, comma 5 thirds, which sure enough is parallel to the normal vector right there. Great. All right, our last example here is we're going to try to find the greatest volume of a rectangular box, which can be inscribed in a sphere of radius k. So I have a sphere of radius k, and in it I have a box. It's a little bit hard to, to see, even using technology, but the vertices of this box should be on the surface of the sphere. So to make this problem a little bit simpler, we're going to put the center of the sphere, and which will also be the center of the box, at the origin. So that means that the corner of the box in the first octant has coordinates x, comma, y, comma, z. And that means that the length, width, and height are 2x, 2y, and 2z, because you go, since the center of the box is at the origin, you have some portion on each side of the coordinate planes. And so the volume then would be 8 times x times y times z. So what we're trying to do is maximize that volume. And the constraint is that x, the point x, y, z has to be on the sphere, which means that x squared plus y squared plus z squared would have to equal k squared, or I could just subtract k squared from each side and get x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus k squared equals zero. And so that will be our function g. So now let's go through the mechanics. What do I need? I need to calculate the gradient of the volume function. So taking the partial with respect to x, I just get 8yz. The partial with respect to y, I get 8xz. And the partial with respect to z, I get 8xy. Uh, the gradient of the constraint function is going to be pretty simple, 2x, 2y, and 2z. So now we can set up our system. We know that the gradient of v has to be lambda times the gradient of g. So we get the following system of equations. One equation for each component in the gradient vector and the constraint equation. So again, our technique is usually we're going to solve for lambda. So I solve for lambda in the first two equations and set those expressions equal to each other. Do a little bit of algebra. I get 4y squared z equals 4x squared z. Now, normally, you have to be very careful about dividing by a variable. But since we know that x, y, and z represent lengths, we know that they're all positive numbers. z is not, a z, not 0. So I can divide by, both sides by 4z to get x squared equals y squared. 
And in fact, since I know both x and y have to be positive, that would actually tell me that x has to equal y. Now I'll do something similar with the second and third equations. I'll solve for lambda and then set the corresponding expressions equal to each other. Forming the cross products, I would get 4xz squared equals 4xy squared. And since I know x is positive, I can divide both sides by 4x to get z squared equals y squared. And now I can go ahead and make a substitution into the constraint equation. I'll replace x squared with y squared. I'll replace z squared with y squared. And now it's a pretty simple e equation to solve. I would say 3y squared equals k squared or y equals radical k squared over 3, which I can simplify as being k over radical 3 or k times radical 3 over 3. So that tells me that, no surprise, I actually have a cube where x, y, and z all equal the same thing. And so the maximum volume would be, well, the product of those three and times, don't forget the 8 multiplier here. So 8 times x times y times z. And if I did the arithmetic correctly, that'll give me 8 k cubed radical 3 over 9. So I'll make a, another video about Lagrange multipliers, which I'll post later in the week, uh, where we see some of the pitfalls and how we could use the same method with two constraint equations.